more recently, we played a crucial role during the white paper protests late last year when we took content posted by protesters on Chinese social media, which was very rapidly censored, and shared it on Twitter, where people accessed it using VPNs, and which led to record breaking engagement with Chinese audiences seeking and then spreading uncensored updates about the demonstrations. Finally, in Hong Kong, with the Google independent networks shuddering as a result of Asia's national security laws, our has been expanding our Cantonese coverage and is often seen as the last man standing for independent media there. The second prong is global Mandarin speakers. So in contrast with the 1990s when we were founded, the worldwide Chinese-speaking diaspora is now upwards of 50 million, scattered across 130 countries. And the CCP has made a point of targeting this diaspora, buying up local and trusted media outlets, and inserting the party's line into reporting relied on by communities for years. This is exacerbated by CCP control over social media. There was a recent study of um, graduate students at Purdue University a few years ago in which it was found that foreign students from China were the only population that actually became, became more anti-American and more nationalistic about China the longer they stayed here, which is totally counterintuitive. And that's largely because these students still consumed all of their news through Chinese social media, WeChat, Weibo, the Chinese equivalents of Twitter and Facebook, which are essentially closed bubbles. The CCP uses trolls and cyberbullying to ensure that any dissenting opinions on there are silenced. So to counter this, we created a new digital brand called Why Not, in Chinese it's called Why Not, which is a different perspective, um, as an effort to engage the post Tiananmen generation of young Mandarin speakers living outside of mainland China. And we have a lot more to do than there. Um, the third prong is global audiences in largely free and democratic societies, um, which uh, Sarah at the Freedom House report covered so well. Um, and this was where the CCP seeds its propaganda into free markets. Um, often using content sharing partnerships, providing free Xinhua content, uh, basically as a wire service, to cash strapped media outlets for free in countries with relatively free press. And this last prong, I believe, is our biggest challenge and I think it requires the most investment. So we've been working to expand our coverage of Chinese influence and aggression across Southeast Asia and the Belt and Road countries. And together with our digital brand, Benar News, we provide specialized reporting on the South China Sea and expanded coverage of the Pacific Island nations. We've benefited from a recent budget increase to launch several new initiatives in the past year, including a new investigative unit that works across all our language services as well as our new Asia Fact Check Lab, which takes a forensic look at how disinformation gets spread across Mandarin social media. So one example, there was a, a New York Times story recently about the CCP spreading disinformation on Chinese social media that the Maui wildfires were caused by U.S. weapons test. So our Fact Check Lab did a story on August 18th taking apart this fallacy using, uh, among other tools, we used a reverse image search to discover that the video that they circulated of supposed weapons tests were actually of electrical explosions in a town in Louisiana. So I have much more to say about each of these areas, as well as thoughts about challenges and recommendations, but I'll just end with a note of thanks that all of this was only made possible by the strong bipartisan support that we enjoy from Congress. Um, and thank you for convening this important talk at what I see as a defining moment, where what's at stake is not just free journalism, but the foundational values that we cherish and upon which Radio Free Asia was founded. Thank you so much. And finally, I'm Sarah Senior Advisor for China and Hong Kong and Taiwan and Free Accounts. You've been four in depth reports on the subject. You have worked on behalf of NGOs with your religious freedom in China, and you've been a delegate to the UN Human Rights Commission, uh, meeting in Geneva on behalf of those issues. Thank you very much for the four years. Thank you very much, and thank you also for organizing this. Some of what I will say will overlap with what Dr. Johnson and Ms. Wallace Paul said, but actually it's interesting to hear how much it will, I think, complement and add to it. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to focus on several key points regarding the current state of Beijing's global media influence, its impact on recommendation, uh, impact on free expression, a few quick recommendations. And my comments are going to draw mostly on a report that Freedom House published a year ago um, called Beijing's Global Media Influence. And what we did was we actually did case studies on 30 countries around the world, Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, Europe, 
Europe as well as the U.S. And we work with local researchers who spoke those languages, had insight into anonymous um, interviews and, and newsrooms and the like. And that allowed us to really give kind of on the ground sense of how this is playing out in so many places. So first of all, what do we mean by news from local media? For our methodology, it goes far beyond simple propaganda. It doesn't move either pair on the Twitter account of a Chinese diplomat or the YouTube channel of China Global Television News, but it's much more than that. It is a massive, multi-layered network that cuts across dozens of languages, platforms, and traditional news outlets. And while some of the activity is overt and not publicly increasingly we're seeing parts that are covert and coarse. So we looked at five dimensions of how the Chinese Communist Party and its proxies are trying to influence media outside of China. One was propaganda, but the other were these various different kinds of disinformation campaigns, including using manipulated imagery or fake bot accounts, um, and then censorship and intimidation, control over content uh, dissemination infrastructure, and also training to try to export the CCP's model of information control to other countries. And we looked at these across these three countries. Uh, so what did we find? Not surprisingly, the CCP is accelerating its multi-billion dollar global campaign to shake up with opinion. Um, and secure both its hold on power in China and its foreign policy priorities. And among, the, among these 30 countries, we found that just since 2019, we saw a real concrete increase in those efforts in 18 out of those 30 countries. And it was very reasonable. Um, and it's truly global. So we did a story of all of the 30 countries. And again, not surprisingly, Taiwan and the US are at the top of the list in terms of the targets for Beijing. Um, but that's down, still right high, but very high. Nigeria, Spain, the Philippines, Argentina. 16 out of the 30 countries were actually ranked as high or very high. Only four are ranked as low. Um, and those included places like Ghana and Israel. But even those exhibited core dimensions of the media influence too long. And I have to speak Hebrew. <laughs> I was like really shocked at what was happening in Israel. And that was one of the countries that was like on the wall of sort of love. So you can't imagine what happens on the wall. Um, I think the other thing we're seeing, besides just the global scale and, again, the linguistic diversity, the way of producing content in Hebrew and Romanian and Czech and so many languages that are not necessarily among the top six, you know, UN languages you might expect. Uh, they're also becoming more sophisticated, covert, and coercive. And we identified three trends in that regard. Uh, one is that, as was mentioned before, Beijing backed content is increasingly getting into mainstream media uh, in different parts of the world, uh, with varying levels of labeling as to its actual origins. And some of that is Xinhua news, but not only. We found a lot of like, local governments from away, like a, a plethora of actors from the Chinese party state side getting their content into um, local mainstream media. And as someone who's been watching this space for over a decade, even I was surprised, uh, it was just country after country, the biggest media in the country on all the sides of the political spectrum. And we counted at least 130 news outlets in just the 30 countries that we looked at. And actually, in 16 of the countries, there was at least one more of these new or upgraded content sharing agreements that went into effect just since 2019. So that's kind of what we mean when we see this like active, and they call it borrowing the boat to reach the sea, right? They kind of borrow the piggyback. And part of that is because, you know, some of the things they're doing, like who's going to actually buy China deal? Who's going to flip on cable to CGTN? But in Brazil, if you turn on the nightly news on the major, you're going to get five minutes of co produced CGTN news with the local Brazilian and Chinese journalists speaking Portuguese. So that's where they're like really reaching the millions and millions of people. So that's Two, we're seeing them engaging in uh, covert tactics with disinformation campaigns on social media. And when I started doing, you know, back in 2016, 2017, we started talking about Russia doing that. The Chinese government wasn't doing that. But since 2017, 2018, they've really gotten into the game. And each round of these takedowns, and I read these very long reports that they publish, um, it, it just gets more and more sophisticated. So actually, in all 30 of the countries, we found either state media or diplomats sharing clear falsehoods. Um, with local audiences in all 30 countries. We also found manipulation of social media posts using fake accounts or other undisclosed links to social media influencers that are actually part of, they're actually state media employees, but doesn't say that anywhere on their profile. And they actually do a better job of getting the party's message out than say the main state media account. Um, and in nine countries, including the United States, 
United States, we found at least one targeted disinformation campaign that was documented to have used fake accounts to spread falsehoods, to sow confusion, or also to meddle in domestic politics. So we shouldn't be under the illusion this is only about what people think about leaders, what people think about following up, what's being said about Taiwan. Uh, no, it's actually what about Black Lives Matter and what about gun violence and what's happening in terms of COVID measures that cover for the government is taking. All of those were topics related to campaigns focused on the United States. Uh, third, uh, we're seeing a rise in coercive tactics. So in 24 out of these 30 countries, uh, we found out this one incident of censorship or intimidation that was aimed at suppressing or, or, or suppressing a uh, reporting of viewpoints critical of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, now, now, that was led by Chinese government representatives, diplomats, or other representatives, and you would expect that. And honestly, a lot of times the journalists and editors were trying to crush it off. They were like, what's this in Israel? Like, what's this what's for us in Chinese diplomacy yeah, at the seat official? Uh, but this is what's more insidious. In 17 of the countries, it was local officials or local media executives that were suppressing coverage in your country. So a local official in Mozambique stopped the re airing of an investigative report about the Chinese movement. And actually, there were, you know, I think there were cases in Taiwan, this is well known, of local media owners with ties to Beijing suppressing content. In Nigeria, people talking about how their editor has, you know, invited by the entity, you know, like invited to in China by the Chinese embassy, and then re edits their piece to how divert it to be less critical. And that's where this broader element of kind of influence tactics, co optation of links and ways in. And again, I think it's one of those things that happens behind the scene. But again, it's honestly, it's much easier to say, you know, go away to Chinese embassy than it is to your own local government or um, to your own and um, we also found examples of uh, cyberbullying, cyber attacks, frivolous defamation suits. Uh, and it wasn't only the Chinese government in Beijing, the Hong Kong government is getting into this action in Huawei as well. So there were other Chinese companies, there were a couple of really problematic defamation suits in parts of sub Saharan Africa instigated by uh, Chinese companies, uh, also Huawei in France, a suit a commentator and TV station because they had the audacity to say that Huawei is controlled by the CCP. And they sued them for defamation and went on for years. They actually got thrown out, but they all know what the implications of that are. But there is good news too. Uh, these activities are not happening in a vacuum, and we really saw global pushback. And not only because we in countries that might be more allied with the United States, but because in democracies, and we were looking mostly at democracies, our uh, local journalists and others are just as incensed as we are if the Chinese Communist Party is coming and trying to infringe on their freedom. And we really saw very creative and proactive efforts. Uh, of the Journalist Association in the Philippines put out reporting guidelines. In Kenya, uh, the Journalist Media Council uh, censured the local public broadcaster uh, because they had brought Chinese state content without labeling it. So they actually used these underlying resilience. That's what we see as underlying media resilience uh, mechanisms kind of kick in when you start to see the CCP's intervention. Uh, and that's one reason why we see the impact this big. So thankfully, in 23 out of the 30 countries, uh, public opinion towards China and the Chinese government has actually declined since 2018. And that's for the credit of the critical coverage we see from our fame and also from international media. Uh, but, uh, but measurements of public opinion don't tell the full story. Uh, one is, as I mentioned, this deployment of broader political influence and cooperation of elites to get locals to do the CCP's work for them, whether it's in terms of propaganda or more censorship. But two is establishing dominance over Chinese language media and information, including via Tencent's WeChat. And I don't to say about WeChat if you want to discuss that more. Uh, this element is actually succeeding sometimes in squashing problematic stories that the CCP wouldn't like, or certainly in terms of inducing self censorship. And longer term, this element of being able to lay a foundation for future manipulation by having Chinese technology firms that have close CCP ties basically become the gatekeepers of content dissemination. And TikTok is just one example. There's WeChat, there's Fightshow in Brazil, there was this news aggregate out in Indonesia. It's not the whole thing that that one or two. It's one or two So to conclude, I did want to raise three recommendations. Uh, one is to continue funding and support the space, not only for Radio Free Asia, but also for all of the media development work and civil society, both generally 
but also increasingly focused on China. There is an increasing availability, I think, of U.S. government funding for those in other countries who want to work in this space. Two, to continue to improve foreign enforcement and other transparency mechanisms that shed light on the financial dimensions of what Beijing is doing here in the United States. And three, to increase scrutiny of WeChat censorship and surveillance in the U.S. Uh, I think it would be great to have a congressional hearing to pull in Tencent executives, to pull in Chinese Americans who have who are themselves enraged because of how they've been censored in the United States and their business has been harmed because they got shut out of WeChat in the United States because they share some political views, something or other, or maybe at least start making formal letters to the company asking tough questions. So I'll, I'll stop there. As you can see, I'm very passionate about WeChat. Thank you, Mr. Jeff. Let's get into it. Okay, so I, uh, I recently had an opportunity to teach a course on the Korean War, and I wrote something trying to induce the license from it. That was read it, except for uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, I know this because within 24 hours, uh, I've found it a little times attacking my argument uh, and, and saying that um, my madness and arrogance were comparable to that of Douglas MacArthur. Uh, Like, they have these crazy views, and it's not just about China, but it's like 
you know, international news. Um, so my, my husband actually told me this. Uh, I was, I was um, out of town for a, a work trip, and he was like, I just got to this, you know, the biggest fight with your mom, because she was saying this is during, like, the Winter Olympics, and she was like, you know, why is everyone um, talking about Eileen Drew and the fact that, you know, she was raised in the U.S. but then went to ski for the, the Chinese Olympic team? She was like, there were so many um, American Olympians who trained in China. And my husband was like, well, one, two, three, two, and to me, I'm like, you know, this Chinese American figure skater who um, has never stepped foot in China's life. Um, and, you know, that was the kind of news that she was getting. Uh, and so, basically, what's happened is that they have, the CCP has bought up all of the, like, gender language media around the world, including the U.S. Um, and, uh, um, and so, you know, it's like, this people like my parents don't know that they're actually so wicked and brainwashed, um, and it's only been in the last few years. Well, I, I would just have to have the like, I came up through the cable packages, yeah. uh, especially on TV in the U.S., there is real dominance, because you look at it, and it's like CCTV before, it's a Phoenix television, which is now, was already owned by this Hong Kong guy with probation, but it's partly state law. Um, uh, Taiwanese elements that in the Taiwanese context everyone knows their probation. And it means that everyone in the Hong Kong language context knows their probation. And that's basically what's available on like a spectrum and it looks like across all of the different companies. And now, on that is there's YouTube and there's a lot of political and independent commentators and there's some independent stations and all of them can get on. But if you're also, especially as a demographic, watching Chinese language media in the United States, you're basically getting a very provision view. There isn't even a choice in something like that. Can I just address that? This aspect of it that really stresses me out when I have to play Frank Carter and I'm sorry, I'll figure it out and I'll go for it if you want to just move forward. You know, it just seems like every demographic is being, if you're saying that students that should have access to so much more information as people born at the current age are still feeling anti-American, your senior parents are feeling very you know, it doesn't seem like there's a demographic that's not an impact of this. I mean, I think there is dominance, but one of the things we found in the U.S., for example, is that there are opportunities for more than even in other countries. There is a diverse exile community. People, VOA produces uh, these very popular talk shows that are available on YouTube. The New Times Dynasty Television that has news that they call one of the shows is uh, Forbidden News in China, the China Forbidden News. I remember watching and seeing the results of the, like, Tibet elections, you know, Tibet government exit. Somebody would never see on Chinese television, and that is but people have to look for it. It's not as easily accessible on cable. And if they're on WeChat, one of the things that WeChat does, and this is a more structural element, is you, there are the personal accounts. It's like, let's say, a Facebook account. But there's what would be one of the same pages or more of like a blog broadcasting, so like an official public account. You cannot open that if you don't have either a business or a Chinese national register in China. So we as Freedom House produce a China media bulletin that covers all these issues and that we translate into Chinese, we work with people to get into China. We cannot open a uh, uh, WeChat account uh, to reach Chinese Americans because we, we couldn't do that and put people at risk and, and things like that. So, and that's actually one of the ways they keep it as such a wall of And so the same is true for any kind of alternative. Like there was a Chinese student who started this newsletter trying to share with people from outside China, trying to share with people, with other students, both information that was deemed as critical from, say, Freedom House or RFA and kind of Chinese state so that they would have the full range of views. She got shut out of the region. So that's the kind of voices, that's where it's like the Chinese American voices that are critical get shut out. And that's where to me it seems like there's something here. They tried to do a lawsuit in, in California, I don't think it's moved forward, but it's discriminated. And I feel there's more that we could do to just push them on that side to make more people access for critical voices in Chinese. Your chart remains on the charts. It's digital, it goes to the press. And now you have a few things on the charts. So, on 9 11, Mike and I and several of us were in New York City. And as we were at the 9 11 memorial, 
time in the morning, I got this text. Um, I can't see it. And uh, as you can see, you can see it. So I got this text, and uh, it was actually um, forwarded to me by a friend. And uh, he was outraged that he received it. But this circulated all over the place on 9 11. And um, so, a couple of things. One, it seems really hand in hand that it's circulating in the U.S. But then we moved into a war, and it looks like it may have gotten around in other countries, Latin America and Africa. So it's more for a foreign audience. But clearly, there's some targeting points on this. Because it's like going around and creating outreach here, as opposed to whatever they were intending, um, which may have been achieved in other countries. So my, my question to you guys is, uh, how do they recover? Are you seeing them becoming more sophisticated in their targeting? Are they using artificial intelligence to start to um, better uh, formulate their messaging and their target audiences? And then a the corollary of that is deep fakes. Have we seen any use of deep fakes in any of their propaganda? Because um, obviously, a lot of us, I uh, know Jake has introduced legislation on this year. Uh, but this is a, a, a general concern, so I'm curious what you guys have to think about. Yes. Um, so the strange thing with the CCP's propaganda apparatus is that as much as it's very centralized in certain ways, it's very decentralized in other ways. And so on the one hand, you have the things that you very interested and not very effective. On the other hand, it's another one of these content is wandering in narratives. There was a pro-invasion of PR, Chinese PR company with um, government ops that put out ads for freelancers on like Upwork and some others, managed to recruit unwitting Americans to stay in protests in front of the International Religious Freedom Summit. And when the bill on Uyghur forced labor was introduced, found those protests. And then they actually used it, the PR company, to create like news articles and social media posts through some networks and fake accounts, but in some cases also through newswire services. And then that it ended up on, I think it was like a couple of articles, something like that. So it would look like an article that had actually been published, because they're just doing a lot of matters of financial news, and they managed to get there. So then they had to get fake accounts circulated, and like, whoa, well, what's wrong with that? I'm reporting about how these Americans, it was like 12 Americans, like a block protest, are protesting against the, the force of the Uyghur force of labor, right? So that is much more effective. To the AI question, one of the things that came out in the Microsoft report was that they were doing AI generated memes now. So a statue would be a human blood with a gun. There was another thing where they like to the Black Lives Matter. Pretend, posted by pretend. It was more conservative voters, but you see the strange thing is it's on both sides of the political spectrum. So that's where you see this element of black white trans fiction. So they're kind of starting, and some of those things do sometimes seem to get more engagement because it sounds like it's coming from an outraged American as opposed to from a clearly labeled Chinese media. The other thing was there was one campaign where they used um, these fake, so it was just the deep fake they've seen, but maybe Big Bang is another one. Uh, these fake anchors, see, so like these personas, and there were these fake anchors, and they created these fake, like, wolf news or something like that. And again, it got taken out pretty quickly. <laughs> Company and they use that. And so I think what we see with this is they do a lot of experimentation. And it's also different parts of the party apparatus. So you have the propaganda party and the state media. The disinformation stuff, right? And more like PLA and PI and public security, like more of the military political warfare parts of the party. And 
the other person got a little mad as far as there. So why do I see these contradictions? I'm like, how do you want to change the division? It's because it is actually different parts of the world that they're asking for. Yeah, I was just going to bring up another example. Um, this was um, during um, the, the height of COVID, and there was like the um, you know sort of uh, anti-Chinese sentiment in the U.S. And there was um, there was something that went around um, Chinese social media in Southeast Asia. So um, so like uh, uh, the Chinese communities in Southeast Asia that was um, a, that was a video of. Um, uh, people getting beaten up, um, and, and it was in the the, uh, um, the tagline was like, you know, look, there are these Chinese people getting beaten up on the streets um, in, in the U.S. and uh, and we actually worked with um, uh, the Global Engagement Center at the State Department, um, who had like the video, you know, sort of like verification tools, and they found that it was a prison riot in Ecuador that they were um, that they had. Uh, Sent around, but this like got a lot. This video got a lot of traction um, in around Southeast Asia. So it was interesting because it was like using, uh, um, you know, it was like trying to sort of vision the different areas. Administration, and it's really a complex and 
again, it, it's not just TikTok. It's like, you know, we have a number of apps now that are owned by companies with close ties to the CCP, including CCP committees and things like that. So, they have that data. Yeah, I mean, my sense is that I think if there was something quite big, we would know it in some way. But I think if it really is some kind of even greater conflict, and they really like they can activate it, that's the concern. Is that when they want to, they can activate it. So, the transparency, privacy protections, and honestly, I think some kind of audits. Like, because if they know they're going to have an audit, even if it's a required audit that a third party does, that's a little bit of their batteries, you're going to have to do some kind of reporting mechanism. It disincentivizes against bad behavior. And honestly, these companies are also sometimes called to turn around the audits. And you see this more in China. They make more money by content that would be censored, right? Than content that is very planned. So they're walking this line too. So in some ways, it can help them if they have to say, Basically, to the Chinese government, sorry, under US law, I'm required to do this or some that. So, therefore, I have to, and that actually can provide them maybe with a level of protection. So, that's just kind of a couple of I think the biggest fear is the one that they have. The biggest fear, I heard from my position, is that they can be the institution that they have to face in terms of the So, what's to say they started a pro democracy in China and they can do the same thing here? Yep. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think is that I think the other sentence was honestly there's more and more like US elected officials who are on TikTok and major media, but not just in the US, but so it's a nice small country of the country. And one of the things we've seen on WeChat, so I think WeChat's a really interesting precursor of what, what could be the logical conclusion of what happens when you have this kind of gatekeeper app. And there were examples of elected representatives, I can't remember if it was in the US or in Canada, who were trying to share some supporting protesters in Hong Kong and we tried to censor them. And they actually didn't know right away they found out later that they said it's censored. But that's the thing, like right? that you really want these platforms being able to basically be this intermediary between how our media and elected officials communicate with, in addition to just the ordinary users, right? But those even higher you know influencer institutions, right? And so I think that's where again some kind of requirements on transparency and then audits to make sure they're telling the truth with the transparency reports. Um, to be 
people in China. And it works, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of people, not maybe a drop in the bucket, but each year who are able to read that content. As I understand, and I think that there, you know, there's a possibility for those groups to scale their efforts more. One of the things, as I understand, is that uh, the funding starts to get kind of siphoned down as it goes through our own bureaucracy. So, and there are a lot of other initiatives that can promote internet freedom, both in Asia and in China. But basically, that one part of the program, how do people help people jump the firewall and jump a few million years? So, you say, what do you mean to be not in China, but outside of China, which is what you so one of the proposals that we have, um, and it's not just uh, RFA's reporting, but it's um, all of USAGM's, is, um, is to basically create the same kind of like newswire that um, Xinhua is doing to, to try to give content to, you know, um, uh, 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 um, you know, a, a newspaper in Thailand that doesn't have money to, um, you know, to invest itself. So, um, and this isn't just like news about, uh, you know, what China is doing or whatever, but this is, you know, their domestic news, um, as well as international news, um, and give them, you know, an alternative to, to what China is doing. Um, and then secondly, to what uh, Sarah's uh, saying, our sister organization, the Open Taiwan Fund, um, is, uh, you know, they're the ones who actually incubate all of these um, different tools that, uh, that uh, are required to, to bring uh, um, internet freedom to, uh, to different populations. So they were used during the, um, during the protests in Iran as well as um, in, uh, inside China. So, like, basically uh, finding new and different ways to, uh, to find that um, is, uh, is I mean, I think contributing to a star like the lab expert on that particular technology is if you need nodes that are local, that you want to start with the target of that becomes much more dangerous um, for people. Whereas a lot of these apps that work have some kind of decentralized service system or servers out in China, local layers of anonymity. That's a technical I think it's a more yeah. political question of I think the bigger question would be, and this would obviously be some discussion we have with the Chinese government, and this is maybe more parallel to the Ukraine example. Is Taiwan is a democracy with a free internet, and if there were to be some kind of invasion, you know, what are the things they have to maintain that openness? Um, you know, if something like that would happen, because there you would have cooperation on the ground to have something set up. Yeah, I think the open part is very interesting. Thank you, Mark. Just as the internet can be a tech platform, it's kind of been made in capitalism through you know, what we were experiencing surveillance, advertising, and I don't know how to put it. GDP has used it for social control. And then he has exported these surveillance technologies to other platforms. What else should we be doing to counter that? There have to be additional export controls and doing more. The right standpoint, so the appearance of the regulations there. And then I do not believe that the American public understands the individual line. Um, I think they would benefit from a public hearing on this um, rather than come around people to help them do that. So, give us some examples. Like, uh, you mentioned Black Lives Matter and COVID and elections, and this can go into the next election. How are we much more sophisticated? Um, Thank you. 
another important message to some of the health issues that we hear in the European capitals, in some of the countries of this world, particularly the Asian capitals, the United States is not an application to make a very important loss in the countries. So it's supposed to be determined that I've spent time recently. You know, I was supposed to be fortunate to just fall in with the four programs and to spend several weeks in the study and it's a special story that research capability that would give for affairs and defend the professionals very exciting to how their technological landscape has to be transformed by the world's being a chance to have a set of the water that gets in the way to be able to control the assessing of aspects of the nation states economy and all these areas that there are no obvious alternative practical experiences that there are no obvious alternatives who's going to sell us their sense of technology that we Who's going to sell us and get all this ICT and tech and the technology at a price that we can afford? And so until those alternatives exist, and until the US and other countries are providing them, uh, you know, this, this goes back to the numbers from the beginning. You know, it was divided in some quarters and did the time effect that we could have a lot of the needed technological power that can support democratic efforts of the states to send those points. Well, it doesn't exist. There's just I mean, I think some of what you're talking about is also, this isn't as much of expertise, but let's say the Huawei safe cities. Those are really spreading all over the world, not only in autocratic countries. I mean, some of it's in like the early cities. I think that's where it's really kind of in the balance. Uh, and again, that's actually, you know, part of the biggest challenge for open society is like the mixed use. It's like some kind of technology that could have a beneficial use. In some cases, that there are real innovative or, or innovation or other um, advantages that the technology from China has. We saw that with that digital television in Africa. To start time, the Chinese own company has gotten a real, a really good footprint. Honestly, part of it because of developed in rural China, it just works better in like rural parts of Africa than the Japanese or the U.S. or the European counterparts. And they got a real foothold in the market. And then lo and behold, now they've got these, you know, you know digital television help with this transition into all these villages and the most affordable packages. What do they have? China, the CGTN, the Chinese state media, the local African media. If you want to get CNN, BBC Africa, which is probably CGTN Africa's biggest competitor, you have to go up quite a bit of a notch in terms of the price that you pay and therefore it's not a popular package. That's a really tricky question, right? That becomes really difficult and how, and that's what I mean in terms of this example when once there's the gatekeeper there and once there aren't maybe certain legal requirements, for diversity of coverage or diversity of content. That's why I think it's more about not so much shutting them out, but making them play. To take a look at it, Beijing, they make our companies play by their rules, but having Apple censor all these apps, how do we make them play by our rules by requiring a certain level of diversity of content on certain type of platforms, for example? Um, I mean, I think to the question, I don't do anything else in export control. Export control also isn't my kind of I mean, I think there has been work at the Commerce Department side. I think in general, this conversation among allies, and we see in general in this space that good ideas that come up in Europe, come to the US, and the US, come to Australia. So I think there is kind of, you know, we're also experimenting, honestly, how to respond and, and see what we can do. Um, I think on the manipulation, so there have been just, you know, it started kind of before COVID, but in the US, the first campaigns were targeting more Chinese dissidents and Chinese language spirit reputations and things like that. Then in COVID, you started to see reports of things like text messages going out and saying that there was going to be a nationwide military law, for example, right? Uh, the New York Times reported on it. Then you get into like elections. And again, we haven't seen anything favoring one side of the political spectrum or the other. It's just like both, right? And sometimes it's honestly, there's like levels of transparency to some of the reports I have access to, um, and it only goes so far. So if you look at like Google's YouTube quarterly report, you'll see see that they actually, the number of video and channels they take down linked to China far exceeds Russia. And they always say, though, is a sentence that some of these were spammy accounts, but others were engaged in topics that so social division in the United States. 
So we know they're doing that, but I don't really have access to information beyond that. I mean, I think what we do see in some of these recent but we do see them for me, again, through these kind of a, a fake account pretending to be a real person, and then they get an actual real media influencer with a million followers to share a video claiming election for Like there was at least one incident of that, right? Um, and then they have to get kind of disguised as voters. So I think those are really the most problematic. I would just say also, like with regards to WeChat, it seems some of what we've seen in California. And this gets tricky because you're also talking about a particular minority in terms of how also our intelligence agencies engage. But honestly, in China's own speakers that WeChat users are concentrated in certain parts of the United States, in certain districts in New York and New Jersey, and use it up still a in California. And some of those districts are actually a majority of the voters. And so a disinformation campaign or some kind of manipulation campaign to smear the reputation of a candidate is maybe very critical with CCP, which we just saw in Canada as a Hong Kong father from Hong Kong. That is the final decision. That's why I don't actually want to manipulate the outcome of the US election. That's why we know. And I think if we talk about the protocol system, you know, and how split it is and how close the whole house of the Senate are, and like if you flip one district, then you could really like change the outcome. So you want to be careful and overly suspicious, but that's again where there's, I think, vulnerabilities that we have. Um, and in terms of how do you insulate and create the kind of privacy, uh, transparency safeguards uh, to disincentivize or to catch something like that if it does start to happen? Less than 15 minutes, we've got to get to uh, New House, so that has it. So, New House. Thanks for sharing that. So, I'm supportive of these concerns. I guess we see how the world can be concerned with this. I think 
one way would be to have some kind of escalating sanctions. So you have a harder report, and they don't comply with that, well, then there's a sanction. If they get caught doing something problematic, so it's kind of like in school, you know, first you get to, to, to the principal's office, then you get detention and suspension and expulsion. And again, the tension of the type one has done with child, some of these media, not so much as that, um, that are very probation, and it's clear they've given them warnings, they've given them opportunities to uh, change the bureaucratic structure so there isn't as much ownership over editorial control. When they haven't complied, that's when they took China Times off the air. There. And people can still have some internet, but that was, and so that's in terms of a democratic regulatory process where you're maybe giving them chances, but I think that also fends off, you know, um, you know, legitimate you concerns over the same First Amendment because here you're saying, well, you had a chance. Um, and from, you know, CGT had often a chance in London to, you know, not be part of formerly the Congress Party and did it. So then the British regulator said, okay, you can't broadcast. Yeah, you say Taiwan is an example. I think there is so much more awareness now in Taiwan um, on uh, the CCP influence and, and uh, leading up to the elections in January uh, than there were like four years ago. So there was a lot more interference, I think. Uh, I think in 2020 was much better than 2018. They got caught yeah. laughing in 2018 and see that there was very effective manipulation. It really ran down and again. It was one of those victims. Like it was a real win. It actually managed to fend off a major like PR. Because there is real political warfare attack to try to manipulate the